I am going to go ahead and get us started um, on today's subject. So um, uh, let me do the, the intro part of things. Let me go ahead and grab uh, uh, my, um, my share here so that uh, you all can see what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to pull up the, uh, what we call the slideshow, only because I created this and it's, uh, it's a great way for us to kind of get some of the ground rules out of the way before we get started. So um, we've been doing these webinars now for uh, the last uh, six or seven months and, and they've been powerfully successful. Uh, we're really pleased at the association that we have such great attendance and, and, it's, and it's you, the, the, those real estate agents, members of, of the association that, that want to do better in their business and, and be more professional about what they do that make it so important. So essentially your drive is feeding us. I mean, it's uh, obviously these are free. Um, and so uh, I, I hate to say you get what you pay for, but you got me. So um, we'll talk a little bit about um, what we're gonna do today. Um, uh, but, but in fact, let's go ahead and get started. So um, Greater San Diego Association of Realtors, God love them. Um, we're doing a webinar. There's my name, Kevin M. Burke, uh, JD. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's my telephone number if you need to get a hold of me. Um, my phone doesn't ring quite as much as people think it does, but uh, you are more than welcome to call me. I am extension number four. Um, and uh, even while we're sitting here, I'm getting a call. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, dismiss that. Um, in the meantime, there's an email address, which is even better. A lot of times it, it uh, gives me um, an opportunity to send things to you if, if there's something that you're asking for. Um, for example, the slides today, um, there's information that we're going to be talking about in today's presentation that, that um, I can email to you if you would like it. Uh, some, some of it's, uh, I, I think most all of it's very important because it, it represents a change in our business uh, and a change in, in um, exactly what we've talked about through these many, uh, many decades um, where we respond to legislation, we respond to litigation, uh, and that's uh, essentially the crux of today's uh, conversation. So um, there's my email address. Uh, it's long and lengthy. Um, you see I've uh, put upper case on, on the words, uh, and that's kind of the convention on, on how to, uh, to uh, communicate uh, with the, um, uh, to make it so that it doesn't run together, it makes it easier to understand what we're trying to say. Okay, all right, so that being said, uh, let me uh, go to the second slide. So thank you all for joining us. We will be speaking about the California Association of Realtors new and revised forms. Uh, last week we did cover um, the, the first three of four of the new forms. Um, and, uh, it, and we literally spent an entire hour and a half and, and almost went into two hours on, on the subject because um, the biggest one in there was the um, uh, rent cap and just cause addendum that, that the California Association of Realtors just created. So there was a lot of dialogue on that. If you need to get caught up on that, um, these are being taped. These webinars are being taped and you can go to our website, sdar.com. Uh, it doesn't cost you to get into them. Just click on education uh, and down at the bottom, you'll see webinars. And when you get to webinars, you can see that we've taped all these. Um, they're also available on YouTube. Uh, and I have to thank the association for making these available. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy to do it. And, and obviously a lot of background um, research uh, before we get to it, but we want to make sure that you are getting the best information as quickly as possible. My, my kudos to the California, the attorneys at the California Association of Realtors, um, the law, uh, the most of what affected our forms for this, uh, this term, um, um, the law passed in the beginning of October. Um, and so, of course, there were revisions and, and different input on it. And, and yet our attorneys uh, came up with the forms that we needed to have to use to protect you, to protect your client. And that's where this all comes from. So the, the, the big message here is uh, thank you to the attorneys at the association um, for uh, their effort in in doing a really fast job at putting this all together. I personally think this is going to go on for quite some time. Um, the legal challenges are already in place. The, the you know, our arguments about constitution, all those things, all that stuff's going on. But you and I just need to worry about how do we do business today? We can't sit around and wait for somebody else to make the decision for us. We need to work with what we've got. So like it or not, it's here. Um, and and uh, let the fight uh, be had by those that need to have that fight. So um, in the meantime, let's go ahead and move forward. 
my name is Kevin Burke. I am the proud immediate past president of the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors. Uh, it was a, a good year. It was probably the fastest year of my life, um, but I enjoyed it very much. It was, uh, there was a lot to do. Uh, when they tell you ahead of time, be prepared to be busy, uh, you have no idea. <laughs> it's a, what a great experience. So, um, and again, my goal, I, I became uh, uh, known as the education president. My goal is to um, pass what I have learned on to you and, and hopefully it will help you in your business. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we are. So I always throw this page up here. It's got to do with some of the things that I have done. Obviously, I've been uh, in the business of real estate for over 40 years now. Um, and uh, I, I tell everybody I'm not really that good at what I do. It's just that I've outlived everybody that has any memory of, of what I was doing back 40 years ago. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to say I am still here. Uh, I am planning on continuing to be here for some time. And by the way, that has to do also with my association with the association. I believe in the realtor cause and so um, at, at all levels. And so um, I was just uh, appointed again, uh, thank you to Vince Malta, um, appointed again to the risk management committee at the national level. Obviously, I'm on the risk management committee at the state level and again on the uh, local level at the San Diego Association. I'm all about managing risk. There's no such thing as a career, especially not real estate, where there is no risk, but we have to at least try to minimize our risk the best that we can. So I, I'm just on a constant growing, constant learning curve. Uh, and I do a lot of talks around the country, uh, and it's my favorite thing to do. I'm hoping that I will start uh, getting back into my life with the, with the pitch sessions in San Diego, uh, and be able to go from session to session and, and share with uh, everyone, you know, what's happening today. Um, we we need that. I think we need that that ombudsman, the practitioner, and I'm a practitioner like you. I'm, uh, I don't practice law, um, but I do real estate much like you do real estate. Um, sometimes people say I do more than most uh, in, in transaction wise. Uh, we're handling quite a few transactions per year um, and we do handle transactions for other brokers. So um, that being said, I'd rather that, um, w you know, I, I've, I've always said that, that uh, we do uh, risk management rather than damage control. So we, we would much rather teach people how to do well in their business and avoid the problems that, that do happen just by nature in this business, um, but rather than having to keep on putting out fires, that's, that's not our goal in life. So um, graduated first in my class in law school, American Jewish Prudence Award. Uh, I don't think I need to go through much more of this, but uh, anyway, that's the way it is. I do teach at, uh, I, I've eliminated my practice of teaching at the colleges. I was teaching at three colleges and I've eliminated two of them. Um, now I only teach at the college uh, at UCSD, continuing education for attorneys. Uh, and, and people ask me, why'd you stop teaching? And they all, your classes were so good. And, and I said, well, here's the problem. A lot of the people I was uh, teaching were people that were just looking to get a credit. Um, and, and not necessarily going to do real estate. I'd rather help you do real estate um, than, uh, than maybe talk to a room full of people that are just thinking about it or people that are really just there to earn a college credit. And so, I mean, I taught for 15 years uh, and, and that was a, that was a two-step for sure running around, but I'd rather teach you. I'd rather help you to do more business and to do it well. So um, uh, that's just kind of the deal. So I do teach continuing education for attorneys, uh, MCLE approved courses, ABA approved at the, at the uh, uh, UCSD, um, but that's uh, just because I, I like um, uh, abusing them. So um, that being said, uh, I have a couple of people I would like to thank. Uh, I would like to thank the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors, obviously, for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today uh, and every week, as we have done. And, and we have been doing them twice a week, by the way. We switched to Thursdays because Wednesdays seem to be a little problematic. Um, the proof in the pudding is that, you know, we switched to Thursdays and we've got a hundred and something people on this webinar, which is, you know, pretty good for the fact that, that uh, we need to do a better job marketing it. Um, but uh, thank you to the association. Thank you to our education committee. Uh, Don Tanner, um, uh, he has just started his term as chair of our education committee. I'm very excited about that. Don is a super guy, uh, and uh, there's going to be a lot of good coming out of, of the committee, um, as there has been for all these many years. Uh, Rocky Rockhill will be the vice chair, uh, and uh, she has done well and certainly welcomed us in, in 
in continuing this process. The, the webinars were in their infancy a year ago. Uh, now they're becoming uh, almost half of what we're doing at the association. We've realized you can't drive. It's just too much, right? You're in, you're in, you know, in Fallbrook or in San Marcos and you're a member of San Diego and you don't want to have to drive down to Kearney Mesa to take a class. Uh, you know, now we've eliminated traffic, we've eliminated gas, we've eliminated an hour and a half of your of your uh, energy at the event, much less the hour and a half each way. So this is a lot better this way. So uh, Jane, love Jane, she's awesome. Um, she uh, teases me all the time. Um, I, I sent her a message today and I said, I don't know if I can handle this. This is over a hundred people, this is crazy. And of course, you know, I, I was just kidding with her, um, but she came back and said, this is all you, you can handle this. So she's super, David Martin, awesome guy. He converts all this to, to making sense. So he's the guy that, that takes care of that. And so thank you, David, appreciate your effort. And of course, Linda Dryley, who is not on here um, because she uh, uh, is, is still on the education committee, but she's not uh, been appointed as a chair or vice chair position. Um, and it's a limited uh, thing, but Linda's responsible for making sure she called me uh, just a short while ago, reminding me that I have a presentation to do today because she knows that sometimes I get involved in the things I'm doing and I forget. So I'm sorry about that. But uh, we do have a lot of fun and Linda, God love her, she uh, makes sure I stay on track and stay focused. So without their efforts, these webinars would not have been possible. Uh, and if you know me, you know that that's clearly the case, right? So um, we will be talking, we will be conversing on subjects that appear to be legal in nature. I am not a practicing attorney. Uh, I just knew my last year of law school that there was no way I was going to practice. It's just, uh, I just, uh, there's a lot of happiness in what I do. Uh, and law school was about in the middle of my career. And I just realized, you know what, now I can take what I've learned at least, not wasted, but the, the time I've spent uh, in my degree um, to, uh, to, to, implemented into real estate because you and I both know a lot of what we do in real estate is real close to that legal thing. And so we need to be careful about our conversations. We need to be careful about, um, you know, what we say, and I'm going to help you with that. Okay. So uh, I am not a practicing attorney, um, but um, I, I do a lot of trial work. Uh, and God knows I've got a couple of emails right now, uh, cases that I'm working on. I've got some uh, trial work next week. Uh, and uh, keeps me busy. So I do trial work as an expert witness on a variety of subjects. Standard of care is my big thing. Standard of care, standard of practice, agents' duties of inspection, disclosure, sellers' duties, uh, market conditions, believe it or not, in San Diego. So I do a lot of things, a lot of uh, that kind of work. So um, our conversation today is not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, uh, nor for that of your attorney. So listen, I'm going to tell you something. Your broker is there to defend you and to make sure that, uh, that uh, you're doing things according to policy. Uh, and you need to make sure that you reach out to your broker and, and speak with them when, when uh, it is appropriate. And, and, and likewise for your attorney. I would never want to do or say anything that would, that would usurp uh, what they are doing. They are paid to take care of you. So, um, so that being said, consult with them as appropriate. Uh, everything I know about real estate, I learned by virtue of my association with the association. Um, I love the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors. I encourage you to be as involved as you can be. Um, the only reason I graduated first in my class in, in, with the American Jurisprudence Award in real estate in law school was because of the stuff I'd already learned by my association with the association. So um, do get involved. Education committee, awesome. International department, education department. And so we have the difference between an a committee and a, and a department is, of course, that a department is funded. It's got big money. It's got things that are going against it. So, um, And then our risk management committee. Uh, and then we have also our, our department uh, over the other building. So um, some of the brightest attorneys, uh, real estate attorneys in the business uh, working with us uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and so that being said, moving forward, our discussion today is live right now. It is Thursday at 1.15 now. Um, it is being taped. It will be available on the SDR education website, sdr.com, education at the top, then drop down to webinars. Anytime you want to see it, you can go back in. If you have a question, for example, my favorite was uh, liquidated damages. I have yet to have anyone explain to me what that means. Um, but boy, if you go there, you're going to have it down. Okay. So um, we did a whole, uh, a whole session, hour and a half on liquidated damages. We did a whole session on arbitration um, only because those are, those are the kinds of subjects that, you know, most real estate agents avoid talking about, avoid discussing. I want to make sure you're comfortable with those things. So um, if you're experiencing the live version, please uh, help me out. Uh, questions, input as we go along. Again, we have a Q&A field. Um, we also have a chat uh, line in there. 
Uh, and so I'd appreciate any kind of questions that you might have. So, because a lot of times as I've learned in my teaching over the years that if you have a question, you know, people say, I don't want to ask it. It's a dumb question. Well, first of all, nobody can see that you're asking a question. All right. But, but secondly, the, the questions that you ask are probably common to the questions that people have in their minds. Everybody's been waiting for somebody to ask them. So I do encourage you to ask questions. It's important. Um, and, and especially for me, um, I don't have any feedback while I'm doing this, so I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow. So please um, do, do ask questions as you go along. So I will break from time to time. I can't see the question on the screen until um, I look down here at the bottom. There's a little field that tells me that there's, um, you know, somebody has uh, got their hand up or, or is asking a question. So that's what we're here to do today, okay? Um, today we will be discussing the new forms uh, as released by the California Association of Realtors on, on the 16th of December. Um, those forms were, we released them, but we didn't put them into place until the 1st of January. Um, again, if you're familiar with the ZIP forms program, um, we will not replace a form in an active transaction that you have going on. We will, however, give you, replace them in your template. We will put forms into, into the the uh, forms category, the forms library, um, but we will not add forms to your template. So in your template, we will update forms that you currently have if we have a new version of that form, which we're gonna get into today, um, and, but we will not uh, replace a form. So you have to know when it's appropriate to use it. So for example, we have a transaction that we were writing, uh, put, put it together where we have the uh, our, a residential purchase agreement. Well, there's a new law out that says that we have to notify consumers of privacy information and we have a form for that and we discussed it last week. And if you noticed in, in the template, in, in the, uh, when you wrote an offer, last year, that form wasn't included. But if you're writing a, a form, if writing an offer this year, you need to include the form. It's important. You need to make the disclosure to the, to the uh, uh, seller and to the buyer and the tenant and the landlord of their right uh, or what's going to be going on and then the privacy of, of their information. So it's important. Uh, it, it, you, are, you are covered by that, that act. Okay. So, um, so that's a good example. The RPA that is in the, is it, that is in the library um, is current. It includes the CCPA. Um, if you already had a transaction created, then it, it won't be in there because it's, we're not going to replace, we're not going to put a form in a transaction you have going on. Um, it's your job to know what's, what's, what needs to be added to your transaction. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions about that as you have them. Uh, but that's a very important, uh, very important form. And it's the law. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's in place. And so, um, you know, consumers demand privacy, consumers demand protection, and we need to tell them at what level we are doing that. So, um, so good form. I like it. Uh, and, and we use it and, and we add it to our transactions to make sure that we are compliant. Okay, so that's an example. Uh, next week on the on January the 16th, uh, Thursday, 1300, if you're in military time or 1 p.m., uh, we'll have another webinar continuing on the revised forms. Today, we're going to finish the new forms um, with the seller's vacant land advisory, and then we're going to get into the revised forms, the forms that have changed um, that, we, that you already had, that you supposedly already knew about, but now we're going to tell you what has happened differently to those forms. And for that purpose, we're going to use the redline version of the forms. There may have been some changes um, since the redline version came out, but, um, but if you want me to send you copies of the redline version, I will be happy to do so. Just send me an email and I will respond to you with that. Um, you know, the uh, this California Association of Realtors has so much going on. San Diego Association of Realtors has so much going on that, that, you know, sometimes it's just hard to find stuff. And so I always tell everybody, it's, it's yeah, you don't have to know everything in the library, you just have to be able to find it. So anything that I have or anything I know where something is, I'm more than happy to send it to you. Please just let me know. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Day. Um, if you have any webinar subjects that you think would be of interest, please let us know. This, this program, by the way, is scheduled for four Thursdays. Um, I don't know. We're going to make it to four. I think we're going to make it to three, but I think uh, because a lot of it's duplicative, a lot of it is the same things. You know, for example, the, the, the uh, form for the, um, um, for the leases, uh, the, the, uh, 
the same language is included in most of the forms. A lot of the changes that happened um, were uh, had to do with rentals and leased property. So, um, so um, you know, if you're not doing a lot of rentals, then then you're probably not as excited about it as I am. But we do a lot. I think we're here to help homeless. So that's what we do. Uh, we're here to help you support the professionalism of our industry. I've said it before. If you look good, you make me look good. Listen, folks, I want you all to look good. Okay, it's important. Uh, and and we're in a great business. We have an opportunity to really cast aside a lot of the of the the uh, the thoughts about our trade. Uh, you have an opportunity to prove that that you know you are the best of the best. And and so um, I saw a great video today. Um, uh, President Trump was speaking. Uh, in, a, in a live uh, discussion, um, like it or not, politics aside, Vince Malta was standing behind him. I love Vince Malta. He was our president at the California Association of Realtors. He's currently the president of the National Association of Realtors, super guy. Uh, and there he was standing behind him. And so I ended up watching the entire thing just because I love Vince. He's a great guy. So uh, very knowledgeable, uh, good, good to be uh, thank, thankful to have him with us. Um, so there's the final uh, slide. We're not done, by the way. I just, that was the intro. Um, but there's the final slide. I'll come back to this at the end so that you can see it in case you need to get a hold of me. Um, but for you and I, for now, we need to move forward and, and uh, start covering some important stuff. So, so let's do that. I'm going to take us over here. I got to do the share thing again. Uh, there it is. And then um, you know, I got people coming and going. Uh, let me see. Where am I? Uh, you don't care about my zip forms program. Okay, so we're gonna start off a couple of items of note. Okay, that's not really good. Um, that's funny, everything falls apart, right? Right as you start doing your thing. So uh, report a problem, why is it doing that? Um, this is supposed to be my um, Q and A's. Um, this is good stuff. Okay, here we go. So um, CAR came out with some really good Q and A's. You, folks, you really need to be listening, to, watching these things, or looking at these things. Um, again, I apologize. A little difficult to find sometimes, and this is particularly one of those things. Um, and like I said earlier, they, everybody, we just got so much stuff going on that you know we just put it out there and then we go on to something else. It's kind of like having ADHD, right? So you know we keep coming up with stuff, but then we got to move into the next issue. So, but but we got to tell you where it is. So this is one of the Q and A's for 2019. I like this a lot. Um, the rent cap and just cause eviction law, big deal. Okay, it, it's 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 definitely where you are today. It is definitely part of that statewide rent control that was passed, um, uh, put into effect by the governor recently. Um, so I'm going to tell you, you need to know about that. These are just the revisions to the Q and A. Okay, so um, it goes into whether or not you can do things electronically, you know, if you've been communicating with a tenant previously electronically, these are important. Here's my CCPA, my California Consumer Pri Privacy Act. It has also been revised. Now, by the way, these are two forms that we just wrote the Q&As on them. So, so now we have revisions already, but, you know, even as we launched into the year. So uh, good stuff. Um, I wish I could take credit for writing it, but you know, I'm, I'm not that bright. Property management, all these things. And, and then here we get into the rent cap um, and all the stuff that's going on with that. So, you know, we have some serious issues um, with how we deal with tenants. Uh, and I'm sure you've all had that, uh, that conversation where, where somebody, you know, you, where you've got a, a client and the client, you know, you, something happens in a transaction, regardless of whether it's a lease or a, a sale. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, the client's not happy, somebody's not happy. And then we're running around. I found that before I became, you know, got my law degree, I found that the, that the fear that, that most people were experiencing was, well, what do I say if they ask me this question? Well, that's what education is all about. Or, or the first time somebody starts mentioning lawyers, you know, I, I like that, man. We're running to the bullets, right? I, I tell everybody, I say, hey, listen, you know, you, you might want to talk to an attorney, okay? And so in, in my world, I don't know is a good answer, all right? So when people ask you a question, if you don't know the answer, it's okay to say, I don't know. And so I always say, I don't know. That's it, or, or better yet, start it off with a compliment. That's a great question. Let me find out and I'll get right back to you. 
and then get right back to them, okay? But you don't have to know everything. It's okay to, to not know everything. But I mean, all this stuff, if you don't think this is complicated, uh, Robert Sunderland, one of our attorneys on the Risk Management Committee, um, we had him come and do a talk on uh, Assembly Bill 1482 before it became law. And, and I can tell you, you know, we, we, we booked for 60 people. We had 100 people the first hour. Uh, and Robert's great if you, if you, uh, we taped it so you can get that also on, on SDR's website. He's brilliant. I mean, he's just really bright. Brian Jones was there. Um, and so, you know, we, we had these conversations uh, and, and he gave some really good advice and all that. And I'm going to echo some of that today. Um, I was there for the entire thing. G great advice. So, you know, you've got great resources available to you. Do you want to be having to go to all this stuff? Well, if you don't, then fine. But at least you need to be able to find out where it is. Okay. So um, a lot of our stuff, again, this is just, this is, there's volumes of stuff in here. California Consumer Pri uh, Privacy Act revised several times, even get down to the questions, you know, what question numbers. Okay. So folks, you need to know about this. If you, if you want a copy of it, I'll save you the time of looking for it. Um, although as a, as an instructor, I always like to, uh, have people uh, look for things because I found that there was more value in it when you did it that way. Um, I wrote an article on the um, new forms uh, and and on the uh, uh, so the four new forms that are out. We covered three of the four. We're going to hit number four, the seller vacant land advisory form today, and then uh, and then we get into the other seventeen forms that have been changed as well. So um, there's a lot to do. Uh, I'll send you this article if you don't have it already. More than happy to do that. Just give me a request. Uh, send me an email or send an email to education at sdar.com. That, that's easier to remember. And let's get it all put together. Um, rent cap and just cause eviction law, uh, rent control. I mentioned it a second ago, Assembly Bill 1482. It is the law, October the 8th. And, and like it or not, it's here. Uh, and uh, is it, uh, we're already saying it's going to open the door for a lot of other localities to establish rent controls. Um, and uh, it's just the way of our legislatures at this moment. So uh, regardless of your political position, you're just going to have to deal with it. It's here. Um, and so again, the fight's going on. It, there's a lot of that. There are exemptions to it. There are exemptions to one, exemptions to the other, exemptions to both. And we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. So I want to make sure uh, we talked about it for the most part last week, spent a lot of time on it. So I'll refer you to that um, that. Um, Q and, or um, webinar, um, but I'm also happy to send you uh, direct information on that, okay? So um, in, in, in getting going, our seller's vacant land advisory, so this is uh, labeled as a new form, um, and like most of the forms, um, you know, we have people across the state uh, working to protect you, um, and uh, the San Diego Association already had a vacant land advisory, um, and so um, California Association of Realtors has made this a statewide form. Um, I'm very excited about that. Uh, much like you have a buyer's advisory and a seller's advisory in your offers and in your listings, you, you need to also make sure that you have uh, something that indicates to the client uh, that they have some obligations legally to uh, disclose, uh, to uh, do research, disclose things, and tell people about things. So here's the good news. The good news is you don't have to know all this stuff. I do advise you to read it. I think you need to read it. I think you need to know what we're giving people, but, but at the end of the day, you don't need to be anything more than the source of the source, right? So be the source of the source, not the source. And so I wanna make sure that you know that it's available. You need to read through it just so you know what your clients are seeing. But in, in my work, in my trial work, you know, the attorneys are just going to start highlighting the stuff that, you know, when, when a client's suing us, it's like, well, did you see this? Did you see this? But if you don't provide the form, it's really hard for them to say, you know, that, you know, they saw it. Okay. So let's make sure that we know that it's there, first of all. And secondly, you need to at least read through it to know what it says. And the good news is, is you're going to find that it says a lot of the things that you already know. But here's the thing. Now, if you know it or you see it, then please don't say it again. So in other words, you know, when it, when it says in there, in the, in the forms, in five different places, it says that we recommend that the buyer get inspections by licensed contractors. That does not replace your duty to do your own visual inspection of the property. That does not replace your seller's duty to disclose things that they knew or should have known about the property. Even though we've told the buyer they need to be looking for those things, then it, it doesn't replace our duty, our, our, our requirement, I'm not supposed to say duty, our requirement to make sure that we disclose things that we knew or should have known. Okay. And so for, for many years, and I still see them from time to time, I see 
uh, agents writing in transfer disclosure statements, you know, recommend physical inspection by licensed contractor. And that's like, you know, the, the judge is going to ask you why you were uh, um, avoiding your civil code 2079 duty of a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the premises. Okay, so it's important. So since this is a new form, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through it. Let me just double check. Any, any questions so far? We're we doing all right. I uh, got a couple people here, got quite a few people here. Um, so um, this one's a, it's a one pager, right? It, it's a, I'm sorry, two pager. So it's two pager. The second page is all the where to for art thou's at the bottom. Um, the second page is all of the, um, you know, the, the signatures and very little on there. The, the, the meat of it is on the first page. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're telling the seller that, that selling a property is, is complicated. It's not easy. And, and so, uh, and it can take time and, and uh, it can take months and depends on market and depends on other things. And so now we, you don't have to make excuses for why the property's not selling, right? You know, now you got somebody putting it in writing. So, you know, and, and they're giving you compliments for, um, or giving the seller compliments for listing with a licensed real estate broker, right? Because this form is assuming that you're a licensed broker. So, or, 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 or salesperson working for a broker. Or, or broker associate. So, uh, so you have requirements and we all know that. We have requirements that are placed on us when we're doing a real estate transaction and, and with a seller, they ha also have requirements and those requirements are different. So there's a different requirement for the seller than there is for the real estate agent and a different requirement for the buyer. So I've always said that the seller has a duty to disclose what they knew or should have known the buyer has a duty to investigate, which dig, poke holes, you know, lift things, do stuff like that. The agent's duty is for a, a reasonably competent, uh, diligent visual inspection of the premises. You are not supposed to dig and poke and lift carpet and, and things like that. So from time to time, we'll talk about some of the good lawsuits that I've been involved in where, um, you know, the agents, you know, lifts the carpet up in the one room and says, wow, slab looks fine to me. Uh, and, and then of course, uh, you know, they had no, there was nothing anywhere that said that they had to do that, but they did it. And then now here we go. Now there's the, the buyer finds a cracked slab when they get, um, when they get uh, done with the, uh, when they buy the property. So, so those are important things. So um, that being said, um, your paragraph number one just talks about those things, talks about the legal processes. Uh, and it says, uh, please read this document carefully. And if you have any questions, ask your broker or appropriate legal or tax advisor for help. Okay. All right. So, you know, and why do we say that? Why do we break it down? The appropriate legal or tax advisor, because you and I do not give tax or legal advice, right? Um, and I start every webinar with every speech I give is I'm not going to give you legal advice. I, you know, we're, we're not going to do that. Um, you know, you're going to need to talk to counsel about that. Everybody's situation is different. Uh, Robert Sunderland, when he did his talk, he said, you know, people started asking specific questions about specific things that they were involved in. And rightfully, he said, you know what, you don't need to come into my office because, you know, that's, you know, that's outside the, the purview of what we're doing here. And so, you know, as a result, everybody's situation is different and we need to make sure that uh, everybody is treated fairly. So uh, uh, my tax uh, situation is different than your tax situation. It's just the way that it is. So I wouldn't even begin to try to give you advice on how to to uh, do your taxes, okay? Uh, much less uh, the phone call I get, which is, I know the law says this, but, you know, and then I get the but, and I go, oh, hang on a second, I'm not gonna help you break the law, so we're not gonna talk about that, okay? So um, disclosures, general disclosure duties, um, you must affirmatively disclose, disclose to the buyer. In other words, you must tell them things, you must tell them in writing and have them sign off on those things, uh, those those uh, known facts that materially affect the value or desirability of your property. And you as a real estate agent know that you have to keep anything material to a transaction for three years. So that kind of goes on to you, but this is the duty of the sellers. This is the seller's duty to disclose things that they're aware of of the property that might, that might be material to a buyer's decision to purchase it. So, and that's whether or not they're asked for it. So they just have to tell them everything, get it in writing, get the buyer to sign off on it because you want to make sure, you know, we're not trying to, we're not clearly not trying to hide anything from the buyer, but we are putting, uh, we, we are putting it in writing. It's that important and it may be important to the buyer and their decision to move forward. Um, Pete Selecki, our general counsel at the association made a great comment in one of my classes. I asked him to speak and, and he said, you know, the, the seller says, well, I don't want to disclose that the buyer won't buy the property. And Pete said, you don't want that buyer. 
you, you may not want that buyer, right? Because if, if you're afraid that if the buyer finds out about something that they're not going to buy the property, well, would you rather they found out about it before the transaction closed or would you rather they found out about it afterwards? And so, you know, he, uh, Pete refers to the little old lady with cookies, you know, coming over, uh, you know, the day the buyer moves in and says, hey, welcome neighbor, glad to have you here and uh, uh, here, have a cookie and, and oh, by the way, uh, did they tell you about that mold problem they had in the basement? You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, we want to avoid those kinds of things. You know, I, I just believe the truth sets you free. Uh, we want to make sure that we tell them everything. So seller must disclose those facts, whether or not asked um, by the by anybody, the buyer, the broker, anyone else. Duty applies to disclose applies, even if the buyer agrees to purchase your property in present condition. So, you know, we get a lot of that in counter offers and I wish agents would stop writing it, but I see in counter offers, you know, properties being sold in as is condition. Well, the law says it's being sold in as is condition, right? It says it's it, what the as is means is, is not that, that uh, you know, do your, you know, figure it out yourself, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. As is just means there's no duty by the seller to do any repair work or do any kind of work at all. You know, if the seller agrees to do work, then, then they have to agree to do that contractually. But the default language at law is that they don't have any obligation to do any work. So the, the uh, attorneys at the association did a great job of putting that together in the paragraph and 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 uh, having the buyer sign off on it and then you and I come along and we rewrite it by putting the same language into a counter offer and we don't want to do that because you know what I, I'm I'm not that attorney and and I want to make sure that I have I have someone with the California Association of Realtors or the San Diego Association of Realtors that has uh, vetted those those statements so that they will stand defense okay remember we may have to be defending ourselves from our own client but we, they, they go to great pains to make sure that that language is written properly. Um, and then we come in with language that says, you know, property being sold in is as is condition. And that just restates the paragraph. And we don't want to have that happen. So, uh, hey, Albert. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, please don't do that. Yeah, don't write in there. Don't, don't try to get rid of your duty to disclose. I mean, your, your job as a real estate agent is to look around. You got to do that, okay? Um, and the, the seller's duty is a completely different duty. And I had one just recently where the, uh, the agent, you know, I knew that we were getting a copy of the physical inspection report by the, light, by the physical inspector because the, the agent had this, you know, three pages of stuff that they had written that they had observed about the house. We never see that, right? And then if you, if you look, it tracks the physical inspection report. Well, then that means it's not your inspection. That means it was the inspector's inspection. Did you do yours? And when it imitates the inspector's inspection, now you're gonna have a hard time in the immortal words of, of Veronica Kilpatrick, the deputy commissioner, you're going to have a hard time defending the fact of whether or not you were actually physically there. Did you go to the property and look at it? Okay, so uh, that's a big deal. All right, so uh, um, please make sure that you do your own visual inspection of the property. Don't have somebody else do it. Um, and the, the fine young man who just uh, uh, just popped up on the screen a second ago. Uh, you know, same thing. We had one of our brokers couldn't make it to their property to do their, their AVID. And remember, that's a singular event. That's something that we want it to be separate from everything else. We want you to just go down there on your own and go look through the property. They were unable to do that before closing. So they, they had one of, another one of our brokers do that for them. Okay. And then of course that broker signed the AVID. All right. Veronica also said, you know, we're, we're going after teams that are uh, having the, the, uh, you know, the team leader is signing off as if they did it. Well, if you didn't do it, don't sign it. So you need to have somebody from your office. Remember, everything flows under the broker. Okay. All right. So, so really good point. Uh, and thank you, Albert. That was, that was really good. So, um, so that, that present condition issue, again, be careful about what you say on that. Uh, you know, you, you, you are not getting rid of uh, of your duty to to uh, disclose things again that that present that that the property being sold in as is condition is not having the effect that you think that it is having okay all right and again folks i know i'm preaching to the choir you all know this right it's just that you know at some point we're going to get it through people's head that they can't avoid their duty in a real estate transaction to do these things so um um the seller just does not have to do repairs. That's just the way that it is. Again, if a seller agrees contractually to do them, then they have to do them, right? Uh, if you don't know what or how to disclose, you should consult a real estate attorney. I think you should start with your broker. 
Um, but but this statement is, uh, is uh, essentially generated to protect the broker and doesn't mention the individual salespeople um, underneath that same ticket. So uh, I think talk to your broker. Um, uh, you know, Pete said one day he said, uh, "Listen, you know, you you can't find anything wrong with a house. I'll go with you." <laughs> and I tell that to my agents all the time. You're going to tell me you can't find anything wrong with that property. Let's go do it together, okay? And I'm going to charge you for that. I mean, that's like that's a big deal. But you'll never ever again have a property you can't find something that you can you can write about on that property okay so so let's watch out make sure we know what, what our responsibilities are uh, and 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 please don't get into the habit of telling the seller yeah that's sufficient you can do that yeah just tell them this just tell them that because you know what you're giving them legal advice um, so you can't tell them about the sufficiency of their disclosures because you don't know um, and that happens to us when we get offers on properties uh, or, or even when we write an offer and then we get documents from the other broker that, you know, we just aren't familiar with. I mean, we, we are licensed to advise on the standard forms. Um, but if it's a form we don't recognize, we just tell our client, we just say, you know, we can't give you any advice on it. You sign it if you want to, but uh, we'd recommend you talk to counsel. So um, it, the, the, again, the truth will set you free on a lot of those things. So uh, um, sp uh, specific contractual disclosure duties. So you now again, this is designed towards the, the seller of vacant land. So if required by law, um, which it is uh, uh, natural hazard disclosure delivered to the buyer uh, information about uh, hazards. Um, so, you know, seller um, seller's gonna have an obligation to do that. Uh, I'm not gonna do this line for line, but we're almost done. Seller, if the seller has actual knowledge, listen, actual knowledge versus constructive knowledge. Constructive knowledge means they should have known about it. Um, you know, they, they have a, you know, a $6,000 utility bill uh, electric bill, uh, or I'm sorry, water bill every month on an 800 square foot house, uh, you might have a leak someplace, right? So you kind of have an idea that there's something uh, going on there. Um, but uh, if you have actual knowledge, for sure, you, uh, legal proceedings against property, agriculture use restrictions, again, vacant land, deed restrictions, all properties have restrictions, okay? Um, the farm use, right to farm issues, endangered species issues, environmental hazards, common walls, landlocked properties. I just did a talk on if you, if you can believe spending an hour on landlocked property. Um, uh, easements and encroachments, uh, those, they are, yes, folks, they are two different things. Okay. All right. So remember, an easement is a right to use the land of another. Uh, an encroachment is an interference of one property on another. Um, so they are two different things. Um, I think it was, this is one of the reasons I went to law school. I thought the subject was fascinating. Okay. Soil fill and soil problems, earthquake damage, zoning issues, neighborhood problems, right? Uh, you know, I, uh, I bought a house that was in the landing, uh, the flight path for a major airport. You know, nobody told me that there were going to be, air, you know, L-1011s over my head every day. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I like the sound of aircraft and, and I can usually tell what kind of aircraft it is by the sound of the engine. But, uh, you know, you think somebody might have told me about that? Yeah, so those are important things. Those are things that some that might not have been available. If you pretend like every buyer you have is coming from out of state and that they, they're not going to see the property, or even if they do, they're going to say, well, I was only there for a minute, okay, then, then you'll protect yourself by telling them what you know, okay? Um, are there any rental or service agreements? Um, listen, if you've got a tenant in a property, you need to make sure that you have a copy of that lease agreement. Um, in, in this case on vacant land, it could very well be that you have someone who's leasing the property for a specific purpose that may not involve a structure. So the seller needs to disclose to the buyer whether or not there's a lease or, or a, a proposed lease on the property, okay? Because remember that the, the new buyer takes the property subject to that lease. So as a result, a buyer may be thinking that they're buying the property with, with one intention when in fact somebody else has a whole nother plan for it. Okay. All right. So let's make sure we do that. Tenant estoppel certificates are wonderful things. Um, I recommend that you get those. Uh, sellers also required to make a good faith effort to obtain and deliver to the buyer a disclosure notice from the appropriate local agencies. Okay. About taxes, about uh, Melarus. It's a big deal. Melarus is a statutory disclosure. It means you have to disclose it. Okay. You can't, you can't pretend like it's not there. So if you, if you're not sure if a property has it, then you know talk to your talk to your uh, your um, title company. Uh, your title company will be able to find out for you pretty quickly. It's not going to say on the document Mellow Roos Community Facilities District. It'll say you know Northwest Neighborhood Facilities Coalition District. It'll say different things. So you need to make sure that you understand when you see someone's got a twenty two hundred dollar bill every six months that you know that's going to be Mellow Roos maybe. 
um, you know, you need, to, you need to make sure you make those disclosures to the buyer. So remember, the buyer's got time to rescind the contract, not just cancel it, rescind the contract, make it go away like it never existed based on this disclosure of Mellow Roos, okay? It says it in your contract, it says it in the law, so the seller who is selling vacant land may also be subject to that Mellow Roos assessment, and so we want to make sure that we make that disclosure. You do not want that transaction to close and have the buyer find out later on that there was Mellow Roos on the property that they were not informed of. Um, Improvement Bond Act of 1915, um, and, and then, uh, you know, notices of contractual assessment uh, of uh, street and highway code. So, you know, these are all things that are, are not readily apparent when we do a visual inspection of the property. These are things that are usually pulled as a matter of title. Just remember that if you haven't pulled it already, you might have a problem later on with uh, the buyer having an issue and trying to get out of the transaction based on it. And guess what? You're going to have some challenges. Okay, so that's important. Common interest development. So, um, you know, whether it's vacant land or not, you have to provide the buyer with uh, copies of the documents, financial statements, you know, uh, all those things, whether required by law or by contract. You know, there's been a big fight about our, our, um, you know, SPQ and our, uh, the, you know, the, the, the argument was we put it in the contract. We put it in the RPA because so many people said, well, we're not going to, you know, we don't want to use the SPQ. I'm an investor. I don't know all those things. Well, the answer is we put it in the contract, so you pretty much have to use it or do something that takes it out of the contract and now guess what now you as a real estate agent are giving legal advice to the client uh, and I'd probably avoid doing that as well okay so if it's in the contract it's in the contract it's the way that it is encourage your clients to make disclose everything that they knew if they don't know the answer to it then they don't know the answer so the questions on all those disclosures and we did a great webinar on the TDS and the SPQ and the SPQA the answer to the question you only have a yes or no but, but people think, well, I don't know. So where's, where's I don't know? Well, we don't have an I don't know. We have a yes or we have a no. And so here's the drill. So the drill is the question. Look at the question. What does the question say? The question says, are you the seller aware? And if you're not aware, then the answer is no, right? Okay, no. All right, so people say, well, there should be an I don't know. No, there shouldn't be an I don't know. There's the, the question is phrased in such a way that it is easy enough to answer. It's either yes or no. Did you know or not? And if you didn't know, you didn't know. Check the box says, I don't know. Okay, that's it. That, that's a, that, boy, that, that in itself is probably worth uh, a couple hundred bucks, as we say. So, um, okay, so let's uh, move forward here. Uh, that's my common interest developments. Um, and, and I agree. I, I think you need to get those documents as soon as possible. Remember, the buyer's got the right to rescind the contract on, on those documents as well. Um, and uh, you, you may not waive a statutory right. Um, I've had people attempt to do it. Um, I've had people waive uh, HOA documents. And, you know, and, and I'll tell you what, that's a, a real risky position for you to be in. Um, I wouldn't advise it. Um, so, but those are my common interest uh, uh, um, issues. You might think about getting those ordered at the time of the listing, but at the same time, you also want to make sure that they're certified copies. So, um, contract terms and conditions, buyer may request as part of the contract of the sale that you uh, pay for repairs. Um, whether or not you're going to do it is a business decision, right? Uh, whether or not you're going to sell the property for that pot price. Okay, no obligation to do it. But again, the assumption here is that the buyer wasn't aware of what might not be right about the property when they purchased it or when they wrote the offer. And so now we're in a position of, of uh, you know, them making a decision, assuming that it is a material fact. If your buyer says, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to purchase the property unless you, you know, build a cabana or something, uh, but I, but, you know, there's no cabana there now, but uh, I'll get out of the deal by saying, I don't like the color of the grass. And it's like, ah, you know, has to be a material fact. That's probably not going to fly. I'd uh, be happy to take that case though. Um, so, okay. So um, again, no obligation by the seller to disclose to, uh, I'm sorry, always obligation to disclose, no obligation by the seller to do any repairs. The seller just has to decide whether or not it's worth it to them to, you know, can they do a couple of, of minor repairs and move on in the transaction or can they, you know, uh, uh, stand on the, on principle and, and maybe not close the deal. But again, you still have to disclose. Okay. All right. Um, other legal duties, withholding taxes. So, you know, this is across the country, folks. This is not just in California, although California has its own um, version of it. 
Um, but uh, essentially across the country, the, the state and, the, and certainly the national government is concerned about um, sellers selling property and running off with the money to, to other countries, not necessarily, you know, they're running off with the money anyway, aren't they? Okay. But, you know, if they're going to go to another country with the money, that's what we're worried about. We want to make sure we have access to it. So if the seller provides to the buyer a document, we call it a FERPTA, um, that says that, you know, here's my obligations and, and uh, you know, and I am, uh, I am FERPTA'd. Uh, that way the buyer can rely on that. But it's so important to do this. You are in the food chain for that if, it, if the seller is not, um, is not um, FERPTA'd. If, if, if they are going to go to another, if they do not provide the form, if they do not sign it, we can assume that, they, that they're you know, telling us the truth, unless of course we know otherwise. But remember the buyer signs that form as well. So that form, that FERPTA form went through so many changes um, when it first came out, um, there was a requirement that, that we have seller social security number on there. And then we had privacy issues and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then we created a thousand dollar penalty for the buyer misusing the seller's social security number, you know, all those things, you know, and, and today now we have qualified substitute forms. We have things like that so that we can, that we can actually, you know, cause we have somebody else that was collecting those forms and now we have, uh, or, or that information from the seller. And so now we have some coverage. Okay. Um, so, um, that's important. Uh, so just think of it this way. Anytime the money is going to the seller, anytime the proceeds are going to the seller, you know, outside of the state or outside of the country, then, you know, your ears need to be up. You need to be thinking, okay, well, maybe I'm going to have some problems here. So you need to make sure you're going to do that. Prohibition against uh, discrimination. Uh, discrimination is just against the law. <laughs> it's not just against the law. It's just not right. Okay. So, you know, try to keep that in mind. All right. Um, if you got yourself in a, in a situation where, you know, you, you know, people say to me, well, what's a protected class? Well, you know, there's this little thing called Google. If you look up a protected class in California, for example, you'll be shocked at what constitutes a protected class. Okay. So there, there are stuff, there are things in California that are protected that are not protected in other States, right? California seems to be at the forefront of all that. Um, if you go into other States, uh, they protect people. People that are elderly, you know, there's uh, the elderliness statutes and, and things like that. I'm proud to say that I'm uh, a victim of, or I'm sorry, a, a recipient of that uh, honor. So, you know what, you need to be aware of those things. Uh, do you need to take a class on it? No, just remember to do the right thing and you should probably be fine. Okay. Um, but uh, remember, it is absolutely against the law. But again, it's not just against the law. It's just not right. Okay. All right. So uh, legal and tax implications. Uh, here we go again. We're just going to tell, you know, we're going to tell you the seller, you know, what I've told you, the agent and what, you know, you always need to tell people, I don't know nothing about this. I don't know anything about law. I don't know anything about taxes. Uh, you need to talk to the appropriate professional on that. Okay. Um, I had a tax attorney for 22 years. He finally told me, he says, you know what, you really don't need me. He says, you know, use an EA, you know, so there's all kinds of people that are trained and licensed to give tax advice. That's not going to be me. I'm done getting degrees. I'm fine with it. Um, and so make sure you re refer them to an appropriate professional. And in the immortal words of Jackie Oliver, you know, send them to three. So we have an approved vendor list and our approved vendor list has a list of, of at least three of each uh, type of uh, business um, that we refer people to. And then we let the client decide which one they want to take. If you only refer one person or one company or one individual, then you might end up falling prey to the uh, uh, negligent referral. And we want, we want to try not to have that happen. So we like having that approved vendor list. Um, and we just send that to the client and say, here, take your pick, start calling. Okay. All right. Um, so marketing considerations. So pre-sale inspections and considerations. And on this, I'm going to differ with um, the attorneys at uh, CAR uh, on some of these issues. Uh, I really think that the seller has an obligation to disclose what they knew or should have known. I don't, I don't believe necessarily that they should be going and doing inspections for the buyer. Um, so, you know, we have one of those right now. We have a transaction right now where the, the previous buyer had done all these inspections uh, and, and reports and everything and then did not close the transaction, did not settle the transaction. And so guess what? The listing agent intelligently so provided us with those disclosures, um, but that does not replace the buyer's 
uh, buyer should be getting their own disclosures. And so I wrote my own little letter to the buyer saying, here you go, you've got what we've got, we're giving you that stuff, but at the same time, we recommend you getting your own inspection um, because you have no privy of contract, right? So, you know, here you got a, 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 an inspection from a licensed contractor that says, here's my thoughts on the property, but you have nothing with that person. That's just, you got a copy of a report. So the seller did what they needed to do, okay? They gave their disclosure, much like you have here. They've disclosed what they knew or should have known. If they got a copy of the report, then they have constructive knowledge of what's in the report. So rightfully, they turn that over to the buyer, okay? But should, and, and the buyer, I think, uh, should either contact those people, but also get their own inspections. So we have a really good form for that called a receipt for reports. Um, in fact, we sent that to the buyer. Said here, here's all what we got. Here's stuff that came from a previous transaction. We recommend, and this is on the form. I didn't, I didn't say this. This is on the form. Says we recommend that you get your own inspections done. This is just good information for you to have, or stuff that you might want to dig into a little bit uh, more thoroughly. Okay, but, but. But what about the seller's duty? Should the seller be going out and inspecting their own, in, investigating their own property? And the answer is the seller's, the seller's obligation is to disclose what they knew or should have known, a material fact affecting the value or desirability of the property, but they don't have any duty to go in and investigate themselves, okay? And besides, even if, if, if a seller did that and handed us a report, we're gonna think it's suspect anyway, right? How many of us have done uh, pest inspections in the past? Uh, and you know, I had a transaction, there were five different uh, inspections done on a property uh, and five different results until the seller found uh, the result he liked <laughs> that said that there wasn't a problem with the property. Well, the first one, of course, came up with all kinds of bad news. So you and I wanna be careful about that. We wanna make sure that your buyer has a, a direct relationship um, with the uh, people doing the inspection. So again, my little thing, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and again, I love the attorneys at CAR and we can go back and forth on this with them. Uh, and, and they're going to agree with me and I'm going to agree with them. And, and, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't know, should you have your seller pay for things that, you know, and, and part of the, what they say is right. Maybe now they can go ahead and fix stuff that they didn't know was broken and increase the marketability of the property. Yeah, okay, that's an interesting argument, but all right, I ain't buying it, but that's okay, that's me. Okay, um, questions so far, no, okay. Um, safety precautions, uh, advertising, marketing, and property for sale. So this is in your listing agreement. This is in, you know, on both your vacant land, all that stuff. All those things can, can influence your safety or can affect your safety. Um, you know, uh, lock boxes for sure, um, for sale signs, you know, things like that. Um, you know, our MLSs uh, won't allow us to put in the remarks section that the property's vacant. You know, those are things that, uh, you know, that affect safety issues of the property as well as of the person. So, um, you know, we, we, we want our seller to maintain insurance on the property. Um, the seller's going to say, well, why do I need to have insurance on vacant land? Well, you need to have insurance in case somebody slips and falls on the land or something like that. But, uh, or, or should they put up a fence to keep people from getting on their property except, you know, under their control, you know, things like that. So, so those, those are important things um, uh, to know about um, expenses. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Believe it or not, it, it gets missed all the time. And we didn't add this, but, but a little while ago. Um, and and it, it's, you got to remember, you are not buying the property for your client. And you don't want to do anything that puts you in a position of having to buy it for your client. And so here we've got this language that says you are advised, Mr. Seller, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, or Mr. And Mrs. Entity Seller, not the broker are responsible for fees and costs of any to comply with your duties and obligations to the buyer of your property. So, you know, I tell sellers that all the time. They come to me and say, well, I want you to pay for the repairs. And it's like, I ain't paying for the repairs. I'm just not going to do it, right? And so, uh, and, and guess what? I'm not going to say it that way, okay? I've had, you know, Linda tells me, she says, well, you know, you have a way of saying things to people that, that uh, you know, gets them to agree with you. And I'm like, okay, listen, everybody on the audience right now, I will teach you how to do that, okay? Uh, so, you know, at, at the end of the day, there, you know, I, hey, I'm not buying the property for the buyer. I'm not, and I'm not fixing it for the seller. I did it one time. Uh, it was on a property on uh, La Grande Villa in, in Lucadia. It was probably 30 years ago. I'll never do it again. Uh, and, and it just became a nightmare. So, uh, 
So there we go. Other items if necessary. And again, we're in page two. Seller has read and understands the advisory. They acknowledge your receipt. That doesn't mean they necessarily agree with it, but at least we can document the fact that we told them. We showed them, we showed them what was out there. We made it available to them and, and we're going to get them to sign that. Okay. Um, so that would be my advice. I, you know, my non-legal advice would be to get them to sign that uh, and, and then move on from there. So this is a new form. I like the form. Uh, it's basic. Uh, it mirrors our uh, sellers, advisories, our SA form for our listing agreements and our uh, buyers uh, inspection advisories on our purchase agreements and on our buyer representation agreements. And oh, by the way, on the buyer, representa uh, buyer representation agreement, we did a, a webinar on that. So if you want some really good advice on how to get people to sign that and what it does for you and what it doesn't do for you, we, we did that. I can't remember if we did that over two sessions. I think it was pretty lengthy, but uh, a great form. Uh, we're going to do, you know, our office does buyer representation agreements uh, and uh, on all transactions. So we just do. Um, and people say to me all the time, well, how do you get them to sign it? Uh, and my response is, well, we put it in front of them and they sign it. We explain it to them. And when we explain it to them, you know, we're not afraid of it. We, we tell them what's going on. And so, uh, and, and they tend to appreciate that. Okay. Any questions so far? I'm going to keep going here. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, commercial. And I don't know if anybody out there is doing commercial. In, in my experience, people do either residential or they do commercial. Um, uh, definitely a whole nother bailiwick, right? I mean, there's a whole, whole nother thing going on in the commercial arena. Uh, I would not use commercial forms to do residential transactions. I would not use residential forms to do commercial transactions, vice versa. Um, I may have already said it wrong, but you know, I, I'm not going to use one to do the other. Uh, I'm going to be specific about which ones I use. So again, if I'm doing residential, I know that I'm operating within my field of expertise. If I'm doing residential and commercial, and I do commercial, okay, but, but uh, business opportunities, um, you know, listen, now I, I think I'm practicing law, you know, when I'm uh, doing a biz op, right? And, and so we had a, a broker with our office, uh, a really good broker with our office who wanted to do a business opportunity, you know, there's $5,000 in it, whatever. Uh, we consulted with our, uh, our E&O carrier and our E&O carrier came back and said, well, if anybody's going to be able to do it, you can, but we'd advise against it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, we're not going to do it. So, uh, you know, so make sure you stay within your field of expertise, okay? Make sure that, you know, you're, you're helping the public as best you can, but that you're not going outside of that uh, area that is uh, what you're familiar with, okay? So my commercial lease agreement, lease agreement has some parts to it that are going to be different for from residential but you know what they make a great teaching tool so in my first part up at the top um, we typically call that the recitals okay that's what links one document to another all right so we have to have certain pieces of information we have to check you know what what is this agreement associate with and you know, whether it's in a residential income property purchase agreement or what what was the date of that agreement uh, who are the buyer who's the seller uh, and what's the situs address? You know, what is the property uh, that we're, we're talking about? So we need to have those things to link one to another. So I was doing, uh, I was management for a very large brokerage in San Diego County. And I used to review files back in the day when we actually took files home, which, you know, today we would never do that. Um, today we don't have any files, right? They're all in the cloud. So um, here I was driving down the road one day. I had 16 files on my, on my uh, passenger seat. I'm driving along. Person ahead of me stops at a green light. I hit the brakes, 16 files became one file, okay? So if you've ever had that experience, I hope, hopefully you're that busy that you've got 16 transactions going on, but here I am reviewing all this stuff and now it's all over the floor. And I can tell you something, it was, uh, it was a panic, right? But fortunately our agents had, had put the address across the top of the date. And here I was looking at this and I was able to put everything back together again, took me a while, um, but uh, you definitely need to make sure that you understand what the purpose is behind the top of that, uh, those, those forms. So that being said, we get into uh, what they refer to as the recitals, which is the buyer has conducted, now you notice it says draft across it, but this form is now live in zip forms. The only reason that I'm using the draft version is because of the red line that shows you what was uh, changed. Um, and so this is not a, a new form, this is a, a revised form. So. And it says draft just because it becomes obvious what what uh, what issues happened with it. So buyers conducted an investigation of the property um, and pursuant to the agreement, uh, 
the investigation revealed the following items. So we're going to be coming back to 1A here, and we're going to be coming back to 1B. The buyer and seller have agreed whatever they're going to do, either going to cancel it in its entirety, do a credit, uh, or they're going to take on some liabilities. So the buyer is aware of something they're willing to be liable for it, or the seller is aware of something they're willing to be able to, uh, willing to continue to be liable for it even after uh, the, the uh, continuation of the agreement and then perhaps on into uh, after the closing of, of the uh, of the arrangement. So release of the entire agreement, um, you know, again, we're just going to do this fast, but uh, buyers release uh, either a specific item or, or either all the items or, or a specific item. Seller does the same thing. Mutual releases, uh, we re release on all the items or, or we only release on some specific items. Um, and then what are my release terms? Uh, and so, you know, here's where we're going to go into the where to for art thous, all the things that uh, we need to know, um, you know, we're, we want you to, to understand that, you know, when you make a decision to release something, we think you need to be talking to an attorney about that. Um, we're brokers, we do not, uh, we are not able to give you legal advice. And a lot of the decisions that we make in real estate are going to have legal and tax consequences. So that's what this is all about. And this is one great big long paragraph, folks, I don't want to have to rewrite this. Okay, and I don't think you do either, right? I mean, isn't it great that they put this together for us? Um, and it does a pretty good job. And yet there's people like myself and Sandy. Thank you, Sandy, for being here. Um, people like myself and Sandy, you know, we question authority all the time. We go through these things and we go, well, this isn't right. Um, or uh, Nancy uh, uh, Novak, uh, you know, I love Nancy, right? She's in Solana Beach and she does, you know, she sends me these lists of all the uh, problems that, that she's found with the forums. I love it. She's absolutely 100% right. Um, so, you know, there's people out there that are looking uh, and, it, and it helps to, if you let us know what you see. Um, I've done class, I did a class on the listing agreement for the attorneys and, and we get up to paragraph number 22 and it refers back to paragraph 19B and there is no 19B um, because we'd eliminated it when we revised the listing agreement. And so, you know, I got a hold of staff on, on at the association and, and they go, oops, well, we forgot to take that out. So they did, they took it out and we fixed it. So those are the things we're, we're here, you know, to protect each other, to help each other. Okay. Uh, so there is a California Civil Code section 1542 that talks about a release. And again, don't use this language in residential, but a general release does not extend to claims the creditor or releasing party does not know or suspect to exist in his or her favor at the time of executing the release. So in other words, there could be more stuff out there that we don't know about uh, and, and that if known, or known by him or her or it uh, would have materially affected their decision to uh, to uh, move forward with the, with the transaction, okay? So that, that's all this does. Notice that it's uh, similar to uh, a, uh, you know, uh, clause, clauses that we have in our purchase agreements, um, but, you know, buyer initials it, seller initials it, you know, and again, that's whether they're a natural person or a non-natural person. Um, document may be signed in counterpart, which means that um, you can, uh, each of you can sign a different page, but uh, it's considered all in the same um, as long as the information hasn't been changed on it, right? So in law, we call that the light test. Uh, if you can hold the two pages up to the light and the only thing difference uh, between the two documents are where the signatures are, then it's, you know, you probably got, you're, you're probably okay. That's called signing and counterpart. Um, attorney's fees, uh, as in most of our uh, contracts, um, with the exception of the lease agreement, by the way, but in most of our contracts, uh, prevailing party is uh, entitled to uh, reasonable attorney's fees, whatever those are. Um, and so that's what this says in our lease agreements. We don't have that. Our lease agreement's limited to $1,000. Um, but um, a lot of people don't know that because we don't do leases. Further assurances, that's a, a legal term, um, but that, that essentially just says everybody, you know, is going to provide uh, the other with what they need to move forward. Uh, applicable law is going to be the state of California. Uh, modification, one of my favorites, and it seems to be confused by people all the time. Of course, it's the layperson who says, well, I didn't know, I th you know, he said or she said, um, and that's inconsistent with, with the writing. And again, I always tell people, I say, listen, nobody's going to be looking at what you were doing for three years, right? That's when the lawsuit's going to come down. It's going to be two years and nine months, and, and nobody's going to remember what he said or she said, and now it's going to be your word against theirs. And if you're the real estate professional, you're going to lose in that argument, okay? So you want to make sure you have what you, you have said or done in writing signed by the party to be bound, right? You want to make sure that you have that because if you don't and there's an argument between which one of you is, say, is telling the truth, 
they're going to win and it's only because you have that professional real estate license okay all right it's the entire agreement the whole agreement nothing oral okay uh, blah blah all that stuff and then again uh signing it has uh, all kinds of, you've seen this before significant legal consequences brokers are not attorneys and do not provide legal advice see i'm so happy i don't have to rewrite this you know i don't want to have to write language to try to protect myself and then wonder if i'm doing it right i i'm comfortable in the fact that the council has already done that for me uh, and they've created this uh, document. So if seller's an individual versus whether they're an entity. So I mentioned it a minute ago, a natural person or a non-natural person, buyer, same way, they sign it, we're done. Three pages of happiness, okay? All right, let's uh, fly forward into the next one. Uh, I might have lied to you. We might actually have enough to do uh, four sessions, but we're gonna see a lot of this is duplicative. So, um, but these are a couple things we gotta get out of the way. So notice and changes in terms of a tenancy. Now this is, uh, typically this is going to be used uh, in a residential transaction. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. This is the first form we're gonna see only because it falls in alphabetical order, but it's the first form that we're gonna see that starts quoting the language of the uh, just cause uh, eviction and the rent cap. So, um, and you can see up at the top, I got my recitals again, and then I have in red. Now red again indicates that this is the red line version. In the standard form, when you look at this form, you're gonna see that this is not in red, that this is uh, actually uh, you know, part of the language now uh, with maybe a couple of exceptions. I've already seen some language in here that um, needs to be uh, fixed. But um, so note to the landlord, and this is really, really important. If you get this one down, you're gonna cover about two or three or four of the other forms. So you'll see the same thing. This form is intended to be used when the property is not subject to rent increase cap or just cause eviction control under any state or local law. So if it is subject to those things, don't use this form. Um, again, we're gonna probably recommend you talk to counsel, um, but this is an evolving process. The really good news for, for you and I is that, you know, that we're gonna be able to refer them to, to an attorney. I mean, you know, they, they made the decision to do a rental, and so we may have to actually have to refer them to counsel, and that's the best thing that can ever happen to you. Listen, I like having attorneys involved in a real estate transaction with me, because then I know that they've got, you know, they can't come back at me. I'm not gonna say anything that conflicts with what the attorney says, so they're gonna, I've advised them to talk to counsel. I've referred them perhaps to counsel. Um, you know, we have 26 of the brightest real estate specific attorneys on the risk management committee. Uh, and listen, I think you need to be referring to them. Okay. Those are people that know what they're doing and, and, and they're, and you put it back on them. Their E&O insurance eclipses what you have. Okay, the differences between the two are, I'm not even gonna give you the numbers, but they are into, into more digits that you wanna know about. Um, but their insurance is very expensive uh, and, uh, and because they're held to a higher standard than you are. So please don't put yourself into the position of people thinking that you are giving legal advice because you don't have that qualification and you also don't have the insurance to cover it. And so I've seen it with the insurance claims. I've seen it where the insurance company tried to get out of paying the claim because it looked like the agent had given legal advice. And so you want to make sure that at all fronts that you are, are disavowing any legal or tax advice on any of those things. Okay, so, so that's good. So remember, if, the, if it is subject to rent increase cap or just cause eviction, then you need to refer them to counsel. Um, here they can read this. It's, it's, it has to be written in plain English or it's not enforceable against the parties. So here it says, if you're not subject to those things, then here's what's going to happen. And then, and then they're a pretty good job in here of breaking down the, um, you know, the exceptions, um, the, the three main exemptions. Um, the Q&A from uh, CAR is really good on this. Um, if you look at the Q&A just on this subject, um, and I will send that to you if you want. It is pages long, but if you are doing anything that has anything to do with a rental or a lease, now folks, I'm not just talking about you know, where you're doing a lease transaction. I don't care if you're doing property management, whatever, you certainly wouldn't want to be doing that uh, here for this purposes of this form. But, uh, you know, anytime you, so what, uh, buyer taking early occupancy of a property, guess what? It's a lease, okay? Seller staying in a property after the transaction. We've just changed, you know, after the transaction has closed, we've just changed our language to incorporate what it really has been all over all these years. And that is that that it's, it's not a lease after sale. Sale, it's really a license to to live there. You're, the buyer is giving a seller a license to stay in the property. It's not necessarily a lease. And that's part of trying to separate us from some of the liability that we have um, by calling it something that it always has been. Okay. All right. So 
Under state law, this is the new state law, three main exemptions from rent increase caps and just cause eviction control. So I, I took this out and I wrote it down. I made it in columns so it was easy to see, but CAR has already done that. They did a better job. Uh, one, is a separately alienable single family dwelling, including a condominium, as long as the property is not one of the following. So think about this for a second. Doesn't that apply to anything you do? So not property management, I'm talking about leases, right? And leases, we put a transaction together, we hand over the keys, we are done. We do not take phone calls for broken pipes or busted water heaters. We do not do those things, okay? We are, we are leasing agents only. So, you know, this is gonna be good for us. So what is one of the biggest exemptions? And that's the first one you see right there. It is separately alienable, which means I can sell an individual from other things. Now, of course, that won't apply to a co-op necessarily, because in a co-op, you own own an interest in a, in a uh, corporation um, and, and your unit number is usually designated as your share of that corporation. But for certainly for most of us, we have rental properties, we're exempt under number one. Okay. All right. So uh, as long as the property is not what? Owned by a corporation. Okay. A limited liability company with a corporate member or a REIT. A real estate investment trust. So uh, Robert Sunderland said it best. He says, if I own property, I'd have it all in a trust, right? Because it doesn't apply. Okay. I'm sure at some point they'll come along, try to figure out a way to make it apply to trust as well. But at this point right now, it is an exemption. So guess what? I would probably, you know, I'm not giving you legal advice, not telling you what to do, but I'd probably, I own all my properties in trust. I always have. I mean, it's just been the way it is. It makes sense for liability, for tax reasons, for all kinds of reasons. You know, I hold my properties in a trust. So you might want to be thinking about that. Remember, uh, trust, uh, wills and trusts is a year of law school, so be careful about getting into advice with your client on creating a trust because you definitely want to have an attorney do that. I had an attorney create my trust, okay? I had a year of it in law school, but I tell you, I wouldn't come anywhere near it. It is the most litigated issue in, in the legal field against any, any type of specialty. Most attorneys that do trust do only trusts. Okay, so that's probably what I would do, all right? So in order for the exemption to apply, the landlord must first give the tenant applicable notice of the exemption, okay? Dwellings built in the last 15 years, so a COO, a certificate of occupancy in the last 15 years, exempt, a duplex in which one of the units was owner-occupied at the commencement and throughout the tenancy. In other words, they lived in it, and they're still living in it, the owner is, okay? Other exemptions may also be applicable. It's a complicated law. I told you this in the very beginning. There's a lot of things going on right now that, that people are concerned about and the litigation's already coming, okay? So don't, don't expect that that's gonna happen in your lifetime and then you'll be okay, all right? Make sure you're doing it the way it has to be done at this moment. So landlord strongly advise to seek counsel. How many times we say that? From a qualified real estate lawyer, I had a case, uh, <laughs> it did not go well for the other side. I had a case where they hired a general practitioner. And listen, I have a lot of respect for attorneys, folks. It's a lot of work, okay? And there's some very bright people out there. I probably would have hired a real estate attorney. But instead, they hired a, a general as a friend. But but by the way, the 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 plaintiff was an attorney. So you know, it's like okay, probably should have known better. But okay, anyway, hire a real estate specific attorney. Okay, familiar with the law, where where the property is located, right in REM jurisdiction, that kind of thing. Prior to serving this or any notice, so the landlord knows the property is subject to some is subject to one of these controls, or whether they're uncertain about whether the exemptions apply. Um, so you know they're. It's not just about the restrictions, it's also about the penalties. So we wanna make sure that you know, we steer clear of that. Uh, much like when we give tax advice, it's just never less than a $50,000 penalty. I probably wouldn't give any advice on this issue other than talk to counsel and get that advice in writing. And by signing this form, they're doing that. They're saying, okay, you know, I understand their exemptions and you told me here it is in writing. You don't have to tell me again. Okay, don't write it up in your own words. Okay, that's not cool. Here it is in writing and this is what we're gonna be looking at, okay? So your tenancy in the premises has changed as follows. And this is all the language from the old contract. Um, and then notice paragraph number three, okay? So that's where we add the rent cap and just cause addendum. Uh, and so my recommendation to you is to go look at last week's uh, webinar. We, we drilled into that form, folks. I mean, it's pages long. We drilled into it. Uh, and so um, to take a moment to do that. If you're doing anything that could look like a lease, it's not just whether or not you, know, you are doing a lease, but also whether or not, as I said earlier, buyers moving in early, sellers staying on late, you know, whatever, something, <coughs> something, excuse me, other than a sale, um, we want to make sure that uh, 
you, you incorporate that form. And that's why we've added that. And you're going to see this is a common theme throughout most all the rest of our discussion is we're going to be adding that form in there. So I would recommend to you again that you would go to the um, webinar that we did on the, um, let's say the ninth, the second, we right straight out of the holidays, we did it. It was great, well attended, uh, lots of really good questions. Um, and, and that's, uh, we ended up with a really good webinar. So um, uh, on page uh, two, when I get down here, we're also going to see that this is a common theme. Lots of red on here, folks. This is what created our second page. Emailing a notice does not satisfy the requirements of civil code. Okay. So um, guess what? <laughs> a lot of times we thought that that email was a, uh, it was the same as uh, certified mail, but it is not. Uh, it does not satisfy the requirement. We have to serve them. And this is how we're going to do that. Again, another great reason for you to have uh, them talk to counsel, have have counsel serve them if there's going to be a change in anything. Uh, and uh, because counsel is going to do it the right way or else their malpractice is going to kick in. So, uh, um, and you can read the language. If it's being used solely to change the amount of rent, uh, service should be done by either option uh, A1 or 2 below. Um, other than rent, then we go to A1, uh, B or C. And then, and then here they are, personal service. And so again, in the old contract, it was very simple. It was, here was A, here was uh, B was just substituted service. And then C talked about post and mail. Well, now we've taken that, we've just kind of blown it up a bit, okay? So now there's more to it than there was before. Um, and uh, if this doesn't scare you, nothing will. Um, my advice again is, uh, unless you're in property management business, and I know some really good property managers, there's some really good, you know, Marie Jabavi, Rick Snyder, there's some really good property managers out there. Uh, and I can tell you something, my hat is off to them. Um, they do a great job, um, but that's pretty much what they do, all that what they do. So uh, uh, before you venture into this part of it, uh, make sure you've read this, make sure you go through it, make sure it covers um, that you're, you're comfortable with the language that's in there. And as we go forward and talk about the other forms, we're going to find that a lot of this language is, language is going to repeat itself. So uh, I am uh, approaching uh, uh, the end of our time. Um, are there any questions so far? Anybody have any questions about uh, whether or not they're doing uh, property, uh, doing property management versus doing leases, whether or not their clients are subject to this? Anybody have any questions about any of that? Um, I know it's kind of a new field for everybody. Uh, it's one of those things where, um, you know, I don't even know what question to ask, um, but I want you to be okay with asking. So um, when we come back next week, we're going to pick it up with the, the DRA form, which is the de denial of a rental application. So we're going to talk about a lot of lease forms again, but we're going to talk about that denial of rental application and, and uh, what happens if you deny them based on credit, based on something, some investigative uh, work that you've done, remembering that uh, they have a right to know what the source of information was. It's the new law. They have a right to know the source of information that you relied on to deny them their, their application. So um, and, and again, it reminds me of the conversation I have with people where it's, uh, you know, well, I know the law says this, but, and it's so it's like, you know, I'd be kind of careful about that. You really need to be comfortable with, with, you know, what you're doing. I don't think leases are that difficult. A lot of real estate agents don't do them because there's really, they say there's no money in them. Listen, I've made a fortune off of leases, folks. I've, I've had properties that I've handled. I've got one right now. I've been handling it for 25 years. I mean, I just can't get rid of them, right? So, you know, you take really good care of people, just like in your sales transactions. You take really good care of people, they keep coming back again and again. And there's just nothing, not much I wouldn't do for these people, right? They're just really, really good. And then I end up selling the property that they have. And then and, and some of them, I bought the properties. Uh, and, 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 but I've handled lease after lease after lease. Um, so, those things, you need to be thinking about that. It's not just about the money, it's about where you're gonna be in 10 years. And so here I am 25 years later handling properties that I was handling 25 years ago, and it's a pretty steady source of money, okay? It may not seem like it when you're in your first six months, but boy, by the time you get to this, I mean, it's just like found money, okay? All right, so uh, that being said, uh, any other questions, uh, anything else that, uh, I can help you with uh, Annette. Hi there, Albert. I'm really glad you were here today. I always, I always get so excited when you're around. Um, super guy, good agent. Uh, and I'm just looking through my uh, little list of 
of famous people. But uh, listen, I, you know, I'm glad you're here. And Laura, yeah, I love Laura. Laura always catches me when I don't remember the answer to something. She's always got, uh, she, she reminds me pretty quickly of what it was. So thank you, Laura, for being here today. Uh, and, and I do hope that you all uh, are, are doing great in real estate. Scott, welcome back. Um, I do have a, uh, one little thing here and uh, says, uh, yeah, absolutely, Albert, you're awesome. Um, uh, we need more Alberts. So anyway, that being said, um, uh, seeing no other questions, I want to thank you all for being here today. And uh, if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. I'm going to pull up the uh, share um, our little uh, PowerPoint here so that you can see that um, and, and how to get a hold of me. Uh, and I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Um, uh, one of the services that I provide is to help brokers in the business. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help you. Um, thank you, Laura. Um, I'll do whatever I can to help you. And uh, the, um, um, uh, you know, but again, I may, I may tell you, you need to talk to an attorney. Uh, it could very well be that. So, um, so thank you everybody for being here and I wish you uh, the very best. Okay, take care. We will see you next week. We will pick up with the, uh, the form uh, where we left off with the denial of rental application. It's going to go a lot faster at that point. So uh, uh, again, uh, needed to cover some of the groundwork. Um, again, take a look. You might want to go back to last week's webinar and take a look at that um, rent cap and just cause eviction addendum and, and uh, the Q&A that we discussed at length. Um, and uh, um, hopefully uh, we'll keep you out of trouble. Okay. Thank you again to the San Diego Association of Realtors for allowing me to be here today. Uh, and thank you for your tremendous support. I wish you the very best. Take care. Bye-bye now.